welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see so many people out here. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm your host for this evening. My name is Scott Roy, and I'm the acting president for Catholic Pacific College. This is the second to last lecture in our CPC3 lecture series. And our desire with these lectures is to reach out to our, our greater CPC community, and that being all of you here, and offer an opportunity to dig deeper into theology, tradition, and our times. These make up the three in uh, CPC3. In a moment, I'm going to bring up Dr. Andrew Kaitler to introduce our speaker and the lecture for this evening. But before I bring him up here, I wanted to encourage each of you to check out the previous lectures in our series uh, from this academic year in particular, which you can find on our YouTube channel, uh, which is easily searched for by Catholic Pacific College, and you should find it no problem. I encourage you because during this year, we've been delving into theological anthropology. Our first lecture in September by Dr. Henderson was Scripture as Incarnation. And while that might not be directly about theological anthropology, uh, in it, he describes his, uh, his talk like this. Here, an appreciation for the sacramental quality of the sacred scriptures encourages us to read the Bible as not just a story about the past events of redemption, but rather as being itself an incarnation, a manifestation or extension of redemption in the very midst of our lives. So Revelation not only presents us with a lifeless roadmap for human life, but it must be read as a participation in God's life and cannot exclude experiencing scripture from within the church. Dr. Andrew Kaitler, also in the fall, spoke in November on how, in his words, the church in herself and as herself provides an image, a symbol, a sacrament, that sets out for us the importance of our embodied sexed condition as man and woman. Following that, in January, Archbishop Miller presented who has authority in the church. And again, this might not seem directly to be touching on theological anthropology or, or the human person as such. But we discover in who has authority in the church that this theology that's being presented, this revelation, is faithfully handed on to us today through succession, through the authority within the church. We therefore can have confidence that the Jesus Christ, who is himself fully God and fully man, is the authentic Christ engaging with us sacramentally. Now tonight's talk, which touches on sacramentality and human existence, which you'll hear more about coming up here, uh, combined with St. John Paul II and the human person, which is the title of our next and final CPC3 lecture, well, you can see just from their titles how they fit perfectly in with the schema. So, it's my pleasure to bring up to you and to introduce to you our academic dean, Dr. Andrew Kaitler, to introduce tonight's guest speaker and the topic. Dr. Kaitler. Good evening, great to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's a small world, I know that's a platitude, but it truly is. I discovered uh, Father Harrison because I was in conversation with the Australian theologian named Tracy Rowland, who had a student named Tom Gurley, and uh, who we were put in touch with each other, and he said, oh, and he's a Ratzinger scholar, so that's why we're put in touch, because I do my, most of my work on Ratzinger, and, and, uh, and he said, oh, do you know this Canadian priest named Father Harrison? And then we had a little email correspondence, and here we go. So finally we have Father Harrison here, which is a great, great privilege. So, uh, give you a little little uh, bit on Father Harrison. He's the pastor of St. Peter's in Nanaimo, B.C., and a priest of the Diocese of Victoria, in a church that's truly thriving, in very exciting ways. You should chat with him after. He's a doctoral student at the Maryvale Institute, working on the very simple, I'm saying that with tongue-in-cheek here, on the question, the simple question of the relationship between history and ontology and the thought of Joseph Ratzinger, and how it relates to a sacramental theology. Uh, this, this is the question that, that Ratzinger himself said is the most pressing question in theology. 
Father Harrison is the co-host of the Clerically Speaking podcast and author of two books, Finding Christ in the Crisis, What the Pandemic Can Teach Us, and this wonderful little book, Mysterion, The Revelatory Power of the Sacramental Worldview. Now, I bought this book oh, several months ago and, uh, and was reading it in preparation for some talks I was giving. It's very accessible. It's, it's fantastic, but not only is it beautiful in what it tells us about, but what I discovered tonight is that if we take off this cover, you can talk to Father Harrison about this. This is a sacramental image in and of itself. Okay, so $25, this is being sold for at the back of the room. So after the talk, please pick up a coffee. In 2008, at his homily on the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul, Pope Benedict XVI wrote, <clears throat> When the world in all its parts has become a liturgy of God, when its reality has become adoration, then it will have reached its goal and will be safe and sound. This is the ultimate goal of St. Paul's apostolic mission, as well as of our own mission. The Lord calls us to this ministry. Let us pray at this time that he may help us to carry it out properly, to become true liturgists of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, here in this quote, this dense and profound quote, we have the notion of man as homo adorans. Man is a sacramental, worshipping creature. Here we also see the coming together of history and ontology. And tonight... Father Harrison will lead us further along this path with his talk titled, Mystery and Modernism, The Sacramental Foundations of Human Existence. Please welcome with me, Father Harrison. Well, thanks to uh, CPC for having me out. And yeah, it was great to, yeah, it was funny, kind of funny how a buddy of mine, Tom, uh, who uh, is a great, great friend, got us connected. It was just, Australia had to be the connecting point there, which is great. And uh, I've known Dave for years, uh, since he was in Victoria for a few years before. Uh, he, he then he became the source of my envy by getting to go to the JP2 Institute for doctoral studies, which is great. And then uh, thanks to Scott and John tonight too for a uh, nice dinner beforehand. So it's great to, to be here with you all. Um, so over the past year, I've been pondering the reality of how we organize ourselves as human beings and how we often how, how we've often been duped into thinking that modernity has somehow made us more human we think that because we have more access to information more quickly we actually know more things the digital revolution has given us things like zoom social media and instant access to any news source that affirms our kind of preconceived biases so often I, don't, I actually don't think we know more. I actually would argue we even maybe look, know less. Um, we know more stuff, sure. We have more data, but it's increasingly contextless. The information we receive is more disembodied. It's more disembodied. We think we are more informed when in fact we just have more stuff in our head that misses a ton of the subtleties that an embodied encounter with others affords us. As a pastor, for example, a lot of requests come my way, sometimes far too many, and they can be in regards to the most mundane things at times that may not even be a proper use of my time. As I've pondered the situation and I've realized that modernity, at least in North America, with its desire to kind of sprawl outwards always, has organized life in such a way that we aren't close to others anymore. Here's a simple scenario to help you understand what I mean. In our lived experience today, we might just simply be frustrated when we call the parish office and find out that Father's not available when I call. We don't know why he isn't available. We don't know his schedule or of life. We don't know what he's doing that day. We lack context. And when we lack context, we tend to get frustrated. So when the secretary says he isn't able to be at the phone, we just get angry and frustrated and think that the priestess doesn't care about us. 
Now ponder a different scenario for a second. One in which human proximity and closeness was actually an integral part of how we organized ourselves as Christians. We might live a lot closer and the businesses and social, uh, uh, the social uh, amenities that we would have might be like within a five minute walk of anything. Let's say I just, I went to the barber. I kind of do need a haircut. And so as I sit down, Joe the barber sees how tired I look. Father, you look like you, you could use some sleep. I then, tell, then, then proceed to tell Joe that I was at the hospital all night. I got two emergency calls at 1 a.m. for anointings, and I got back at 3, and then just was about to go back to bed when I got another call. A family was struck by an unsuspecting tragedy of death, and I went back to the hospital and was there until I had to get back to the church for Mass in the morning. I finished my haircut, and then I head off to the next thing. Then later, the person who called the office starts talking to Joe. He says, man, I'm so frustrated. Anytime I call the parish office, Father is never available. You would think a pastor would want to be available and close to his people, but he's just never around. Joe the barber then pretends, proceeds to tell you what the priest was doing the night before. And you say, wow, I didn't know that. Man, I might be a little too hard on him. I think I might even drop off some food later for him uh, because he could probably use some help. I call that good gossip. That is good gossip, right? Our closeness and our proximity allows us to hear and find out information in a human and embodied way. And we can't know these things unless we experience them in a personal interaction. Joe experienced my exhaustion and showed care. And I shared with him why, and Joe shared it with someone else who needed to hear about it when they shared a frustration. If it was a more abstracting situation, that is life that has no proximity or integration into the lives of others, um, and, we just, and we just find out that Father's just not available, then we tend to be frustrated and angry and want to fix things in a different way because we lack the human context to process this information. Which situation, the personal or the abstract, do you think gives more knowledge? Personally, I would argue it's the personal one. So modernism tends to decontextualize and abstract what it means to be human. The decontextualized self is the disembodied self. A popular view that gives flesh this idea is that it doesn't matter what's on the outside, all that matters is what's on the inside. I get the sentiment, but it's denying the body completely. We forget that content and form both matter. Person matters, matter matters, and we are human persons, which means we are embodied persons. We're not angels. You see, because modernity wants us to be angels, and Christianity wants us to be embodied gods, sharing in the life of the sun. The move to a contextless or disembodied person continues its stranglehold in a variety of ways. And so what I want to do this evening is explore this kind of connection between uh, modernism's constant attempt to deny this centrality of our embodiedness as human beings by its denial of mediation. As we journey through the question and problem, we will begin to see there is something innately potential in us precisely because of our embodiedness. And this will also open us up to the notion and question of mystery and sacramentality, uh, of, uh, of the, the mystery and of the sacramentality of human existence. We will see that it is the body, not decontextualized and spiritualized ideological frameworks that deny the body, that actually gives us our full potential, precisely because of the sacramental character of our existence. My argument is simple to our intuition, but counterfactual to our cultural upbringing. To be human is to be sacramental, because to be human is for the material, to be transformed in a non-competitive fashion by the spiritual and thereby lift up the dignity of the body itself. I may not say all of this even directly, but it is implied what's coming ahead. And so what I'm proposing tonight is a more broad overview than a detailed analysis of various sinkers, movements and events, etc. As a pastor, preaching and teaching to a large and varied audience forces me to move away from the detailed orientedness of, of speaking. And I find that especially when giving a talk to an audience, uh, too many details are hard for the hearer. So if there are any parts that lack particular nuance and distinction, please blame my being a pastor.
Okay? And if it lacks a certain order at times, whereby I jump too quickly from one idea to another, I just jump off onto a tangent, blame my ADHD. So for both, I apologize, for both, I apologize in advance. So I want to talk first about modernism. Um, so the question of modernism deserves, I think, it, it deserves a large talk in its own right. What I want to do here simply is to define it, which is tough to do. How often, for example, many Catholics will use the word modern or modernism, knowing it's a heresy, as a way to just dismiss something that is not pleasing to their sensibility. So that's modernist. I don't like how the liturgy feels at that church. That's modernist. I'm sure we don't know anybody who says anything like that ever, right? <laughs> the word is used a lot with little understanding. To an extent, that's... I don't blame people for that, because the document that is essential for understanding what modernism is, Pascende Domini Gregoris by, by Pius X, doesn't actually define modernism. I, I've searched it over and over again. It does not define it. It just describes it. That's it. And so um, that's what I'm gonna, we're going to kind of go through. Let's, let's kind of look at its descriptions and see what the definition that's underneath it all. But before I do that, I want to just make a brief aside because I was rereading it this past week and I'm like, oh, this is, this is, I actually enjoyed it a bit more than I had in the past. And, um, and while my critique would still hold that it doesn't actually define modernism, it does actually have a lot of positive things to say about the role of history in the realm of faith, as well as the supernatural end of man. Considering some of the theological debates that would erupt over the next 40 years after this document in Europe, I was surprised to see how the positive statements of Pescendi seemed to be ignored by those who went on the attack against the Rezor Small theologians of the early 20th century. And that's just a little side. Uh, so what are the essential characteristics of modernism in the document? There's more than the list here, but this kind of gets to the sense of it. The first one is agnosticism. Okay? And it meant that it was bracketing God in both epistemology, like how we know things, and metaphysics, like our thought about being and the structure of reality, God has nothing to say to this. So we have to bracket him and just be agnostic about his existence itself. That's the first thing. The second one is vital imminentism. Vital imminentism, which is simply to say that there actually isn't anything transcendent to our plane of existence. And any sense of that has, any sense of transcendence is collapsed into the, like Taylor would call it like the imminent frame, right? Nothing, nothing breaks out of this world towards something greater than us. Any sense of that is just something we've created for ourselves. Uh, and, so there, and so if uh, the infinite that we might have a desire for is purely imminent, and that if God even does exist, he has no real relationship with the world. It's vital imminentism. Uh, uh, just a quick, quick aside is, uh, a lot of people thought that this was going after Maurice Blondel, who was a very vital the uh, philosopher from the late 19th and early 20th century. Pius X actually wrote his archbishop to say, please let Monsieur Blondel know that we are approving of his work and that we want, we want to encourage him to continue on in, in, in everything he's doing. From Pius X, who was like the guy against modernism, and everyone thought that Blondel was a modernist and Pius X said, said no. So that's just, I, that was just, I did my master's on Blondell's and I found that. I'm like, this is a really cool thing. Um, so the th third one is scientific historicism and, and, and this, this like radical historicism where we, we his, history kind of relativizes everything, um, whereby anything supernatural is expunged from scripture and revelation. And as, as, uh, at, at best, it has a natural explanation or it's myth to just be ignored. Uh, so a, a famous example of this, well, God never really parted the Red Seas. It was just some really strong winds that forced the Red Sea to split into two. That is a scientific, historicist uh, um, explanation of what happened there. Um, it's a reduction. It says nothing miracle, miracles can't happen in other words. So you're already starting to see some connections between these different worldviews. The four, fourth one was dogmatic evolutionism where dogma is merely the result of a historical process where it evolves and can no way adequately quickly convey the truth of God. God is so infinitely greater that dogma can't actually say anything true about God, essentially. Therefore, dogma can not only can develop in this worldview, it can evolve beyond any semblance to its original expression. 
And here we also see that epistemological gap between God and the world that denies any analogy that thereby undermines our ability to even know God and know his existence. So those are your more intellectual uh, theories that Pius was going against. The fifth one is, a more, is on the more personal level, and he goes against sentimentalism and excessive emphasis on personal experience. So he's not saying sent him to, be, to have affect or personal experience is bad in faith. He's saying their, their excesses is the problem. And essentially comes down to this. What I think and feel about God is what matters. Well, I feel God is saying this to me and therefore it's true. That's who God is. The problem of course becomes, well, someone feels the opposite. So who's right? So a quick another quick, a quick example of this is that we can reduce God to sentiment and experience. Thinking on a more progressive slant that why would an infinite God care if I go to church on Sunday or not? Like who cares, man? God's love, man, and that's enough. And uh, you hear that or not? Trust me, I hear it all the time as a priest. And I actually say, no, it's precisely because God loves you that he cares. That's why. He cares, actually he does care. Uh, it's, but it's personal. It's very personal. Uh, and so here, sentiment and experience presumes a lack of relationship. And that God does not love and, does that, and that therefore does not, uh, and, and Sorry, and that God does love and therefore does care precisely, precisely because he is infinite. He can, he can relate personally to each person. On the other side of the sentimentalism is a, that, naive, that naively and destructively says what, it is, what is and isn't true faith for no other reason than because I feel this way. Well, that's heresy. Why? Because I feel that way. That actually is very prominent of an attitude today. And I would actually argue that of all these attitudes in terms of the life of the church, it's this fifth one that still reaps, reap, its ugly head still appears quite consistently today. So that's his descriptive overview of modernism. And I, so I want to share then a definition of modernism that I think summarizes everything we've just gone over. And it gets to the essence in such a way that it can also be further broadened into other expressions that are logical consequences of these various ideas. And it was a definition that my professor in seminary, uh, Father Don McDonald, because I, I went to St. Joseph's in Edmonton, uh, and it, it stuck with me in, from his Vatican II class. He says, modernism is the denial of mediation. The essence of modernism is the denial of mediation. Okay, so what's mediation? <laughs> what do we mean by that? It's funny, it's like, the funny thing is, it's a Catholic world and there's like very little theology on this question. Communio did an edition on it a, few, a couple years ago, but that's like, there's just not much out there, which is kind of hilarious to me because it is such a central idea. I mean, we call Jesus the mediator. You would think there'd be more on this, but there's just not a lot out there. So what is mediation? To put it simply, God in the world, the spiritual and material, the two shall never meet. They cannot interact with each other in any way, shape, or form. So uh, that, that's, or sorry, that's, the, that's modernism, sorry. Um, that's not mediation, sorry. That is modernism, you see? Part, this is why editing's a good thing. <laughs> um, so that's what, mo that's, what, that's what modernism does. But um, mediation says God works in and through the world. The spiritual is expressed in, through, and with the material. D.C. Schindler talks about mediation as the essence of the Catholic form of life as an abiding significance. I love that definition. Uh, by this, he means that there is always going to be a something more, a mystery that both remains in the mediating object that points beyond itself. So it's the, the object's transformed uh, in such a way that it doesn't change in this, like, you know, we, we, like, when we think about like any of the sacraments or sacramentals we use, they, they don't, ex their external form doesn't change at all. They remain, it remains that same way, but what they signify, what they point to and make present has substantially changed to such a point that there's something totally different at the same time. It abides. Like uh, uh, every time I hear the word abide, I always think of the big Lebowski, the dude abides. Uh, <laughs> Lots about mediation there, <laughs> but that's a whole, that maybe for another time <laughs> about mediation in the Big Lebowski. Uh, <laughs> so there is a something more that both remains in the mediating object that points beyond itself. 
um, uh, that that sorry that uh, there is, so a bias significant means that there is something more that remains in the mediating object that points beyond itself. Uh, William Desmond on the uh, on the philosophical level will call this the metaxu, the in betweenness of being, of being a creature. That it is the very structure of man and creation itself. We are actually never going to have absolute knowledge of everything. It's actually impossible. We have to learn to be okay with this. In this view, we can apprehend the whole. We can never exhaust it. Mystery again. Um, thus, absolute knowledge that tends to be a distinctive form of modern thought that wants to not only apprehend the whole but explain the whole becomes impossible in this worldview. It, the um, mediation relies upon humility to say, I am a creature who can see the whole without ever exhausting it. That is a task that belongs solely to God. Let's think on a more secular level now about uh, mediation. Like we hear about mediation processes and conflict resolution, right? You have two parties that come together with a middle person who is there to represent the interests of both sides. In the realm of faith, mediation gains its prominence in the person of Jesus Christ, right? The mediator between, the in between is the metaxu, the mediator between God and man. So if we talk of modernism as the denial of mediation, then we would say that the spiritual and the material, God and the world, aren't even in a tensive dialectical relationship, which is how it's, it's always seen in like a dialectic of competition. Like there's a tense uh, disagreement between body and spirit, uh, uh, material and spiritual, God and the world, and only one can survive. It's a, it's a match to the death between these two. Uh, and mediation removes this competitive nature between these two realities. It has to, because if it, for it to work in a integrated and holistic way, it cannot be in competition with what it's interacting with. So we see this, for example, uh, I think this, is, this comes to uh, a fore, especially in how we see language nowadays. And how we see, I think this is, I, I don't think we recognize how much modernism has impacted our view of language. Um, because when we deny mediation, we mean that we deny the significance of things, that they bear a meaning beyond themselves. So how do we see, when we hear that word literal, what do we think it means when we hear that? We hear it only has a strict meaning. It does not have any poetic sense behind it whatsoever. Uh, it, la it lacks any symbol. So like when we talk, uh, it, it has no significance, right? No sign value, right? That's at the heart of the word significance. No, it doesn't point to something more. It cannot point beyond itself. What it's meant to point out to now collapses into it. So this is that vital imminent stuff coming to play here. Language becomes opaque, not transparent. Uh, so this creates a hypertextualism and a hyper focus on words whereby everything is said is only unsaid and understood in a strict sense that leaves no room for mercy. Thus, it would seem weird if people heard a Catholic say that they believe in the literal sense of Genesis. I would say that. And you probably feel weird when I say that. And you should, because if we understand literal in the modern sense, I would disagree with that too. But that's not what we mean by literal. Because for us, like in Genesis, the literal sense does not mean God created it in seven days, but rather that the meaning is to be able to know, be known more directly. That is symbolically made present through the words. So what are the effects of modernism then? Language is one of them. And Mysterion. <laughs> I do list a whole bunch of the, I have a whole chapter in there about modernism. But, uh, but at the end, essence is this. If God and the world are completely separated from each other, then creation, fall, redemption, incarnation, church, miracles, etc. It's all impossible. It's all impossible. You're nothing more than the product of evolution and you have no freedom. That's strict materialism because that's the only possible answer when you take God out of the equation.
So we must acknowledge that though it evolves, this is still in the air we breathe to day to day, and it makes faith harder and harder to live. We do ourselves no favors in rejecting this fact, but rather must ask ourselves, how do we create a new atmosphere to breathe in and help all who kind of breathe that same modernist air where mediation is denied and to find a new air where a new humanism and a true humanism is found in Christ. So the above about modernism is vital because we can quickly begin to understand how a sacramental vision, which takes mediation as it's central, as central to its whole understanding of reality, how that becomes undermined and foreign to the vision laid out in modernism. This is why it's very hard to evangelize today because we actually aren't addressing modernism when we evangelize. Like this gets into a whole other thing on apologetics. Um, personally, I am not a fan of modern apologetics. I think it does a gross disservice to the truth of things. Even when we evangelize, we put out simple charismatic formulas that are detached from ecclesiology and a sacramental ontology. This doesn't do us any favors. And, we, and if you're going to actually proclaim Christ to others, you need to be able to speak to people in their modernist worldview that they're living in first. So you have to understand that, and, you, and the only way you can understand is to accept the fact that you are already breathing the same air. And that's the best place to start. Anyways, um, so the, as I said, tangents. Uh, so the Catechism, for example, says in paragraph 1131 that the sacraments, so not sacramental worldview, but sacraments, like your seven sacraments, are efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us. The visible rites by which the sacraments are celebrated signify and make present the graces proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those who receive them with required dispositions, with the required dispositions. So if modernism is true, then the sacraments are at best man-made creations that do not in fact bring an encounter with God. And this is how we treat them often. And this is how we often, you know, uh, this, we do ourselves a disservice when we treat the sacraments by, by essentially treating them like they are meaningless. And we actually do treat them a lot this way nowadays. And we, again, we want, we want, our, we want children to be raised in the faith. We have to allow sacramentality to be the air that they breathe so that when they encounter the sacraments, they're then able to see the logical connection between it all. If sacraments are true, they transform everything. I was preaching a couple weeks ago at my parish. I said, my question to them was, um, what if grace was so powerful that it changed everything, including the land around us? That's how far grace should go. It doesn't just touch me personally. It's so great a gift, it should flow out of me towards others, and I then become a mediator of this, not just me as a priest, every layperson, everyone becomes a mediator of this into the world. So if we want people to live the sacramental life, we need to allow sacramentality to imbue everything. Um, but at the same time, so like in all this, in this modernist air we breathe, this is, sacraments often feel, even to devout Catholics sometimes, as almost magical, whereby God invades our legitimate domain and infuses it with his life, much to our chagrin, in such a way to, as to almost force us back into love with him. Because that's how magic works, by the way, right? It's, it's, a, it's a power, it's a power thing, right? Um, we do not see the human as naturally sacramental. We don't think this way today. We think in functionalist, materialistic lenses constantly. Sacramentality says no, material is transparent and not opaque. Right? It's, it, it allows the spiritual to be seen through it. It doesn't cover it and make it and, and blind us from it. So if the hum, we don't see the human as naturally sacramental and therefore the sacraments of the church are just add-ons put in by the church to control us. That's how it's often seen. So a good solid example of this would be, would, of this we wonder is if grace and the sacraments are really efficacious, we actually wonder that often because we find ourselves maybe stuck in our own sin. Or we don't see ourselves, we don't see the possibility of being a saint as actually realistic. This is a form of um, 
And so we think, oh, this, the, um, uh, grace is just going to do its magic and change me. And I'm going to do absolutely nothing. This is a very modern form of receptivity. I just need to stand still and let God control me like a puppet. While receptivity has a priority in our humanity and in our receptivity to God, it is not this kind of mousy passiveness that is all too common today. It is rather Marian to its core. What happens when the angel Gabriel addresses Mary is full of grace. She says the perfect yes. That is, in fact, the most perfect form of human freedom. To say yes to God with no resistance to his will with a humble acceptance of how God wants us to cooperate with his, with, in the mysterious history of salvation. So what does the openness of Mary imply? Her response, her yes, is the fruit of her receptivity. It does actually lead to action, but not in a, I'm going to fix everything, but it, grace motivates. There is a reason Mary runs to Elizabeth. It's the fruit of grace. Her freedom is only freedom because it's oriented to God and aided by grace. And this is where we often fall short. We don't see freedom from the Christian lens, but from the modern lens. We see freedom as license. The Christian message sees freedom as only true, truly free in relation to God. For freedom's sake, Christ has set you free, St. Paul says. We can only act when we are at first open to acting on what is received, to cooperate with our will, Veritatis Splendor will talk about, which, yes, is itself a grace. So why are the sacraments seemingly not effective at times? It is because often, simply, we prefer our own will to God's. It's actually not that complicated. We, over, we make it complicated. It's actually not that complicated. We worship ourselves and not God. Um, we, we are freedom. We don't, want, we don't want freedom. We actually don't want freedom. Because <laughs> freedom, in its proper sense, can only be itself in relationship to God. Because it comes from Him, is rooted in Him, is oriented him, in Him. Freedom is impossible without God. There is a reason the pagans were... Uh, uh, um, oh my gosh, I just lost the word. Uh, uh, they had a kind of fatal, yeah, they had a fatalism to them. Because in the end, freedom's not really a thing. Freedom in its modern context is only possible with Christianity. But that being an aside, I, don't, I do want to get back to this notion of sacramentality. So the other reason we deny sacramentality is that we ignore what is obvious to us. Again, we are materialists too often today. We ignore what is obvious to us in that we are by nature sacramental creatures. So I want to take that definition from the Catechism about the sacraments and break it down, see how it applies to human life writ large. And I must, of course, make uh, distinctions between uh, the seven sacraments. The seven sacraments only make sense in a larger sacramental vision of things. That there's a... Re like, there's a reason the Second Vatican Council calls the church the universal sacrament of salvation, right? It's because really in many ways, the church has to almost precede the sacraments, at least in a, in a kind of logical sense. Um, but, and, and so the uh, sacramentality is what like, you know, Hans Borisma will call sacramental ontology and what I call sacramental worldview. That is, the very principle of sacramentality is written into our being, to which, in a supernaturally gifted way, the more particular Christian sacraments speak to. So the sacraments are, let's just break it down again, they're efficacious signs of grace. This is a good catechism overview. Uh, catechism is actually a great source for theology, by the way. Like, it, there's so much, it's brilliant. I mean, of course, Ratzinger, so. Uh, of course, it's brilliant. Um, efficacious signs of grace, instituted by Christ for the church. Dispense divine life, visible rites that are celebrated. So you can't, you can't separate sacraments from the liturgical celebration. It's impossible. This is why communion outside of Mass is meant to be like for those who are homebound, really, and that's about it. Um, five, the rites signify and make present the grace of each sacrament. And number six, they bear fruit in the reception through proper disposition. 
that's the catechism's definition. So I want to amend this a bit, and let's just make it broaden it a little bit about this more natural sense. So in this naturally constituted sense, it is a sign that is efficacious. It's instituted in creation. Dispenses life. It has very visible rites or ceremonies are celebrated. It does signify and make present what is to be affected. And it bears fruit in those who receive it. Not very different, is it? And um, this, I would say that the second are instituted on a creational level, which means that we are then constituted in our very being as sacramental creatures. So on a more, maybe on a general, uh, well, I've got two images for you today with this. Um, and this is one I'm stealing from Bol Bishop Fulton Sheen. He loved to use this image of sacraments as an example. He says, a word's a sacrament. Suppose I say the word book or mysterion. No. Uh, <laughs> how do you know I mean, I mean what I mean by the word book when I say it? What is, that, what, what is implied by it in its most basic definition? An item, either bounded or digital, that is written by an author for an audience in order to convey a story, information, ideas, etc. Somehow we know what a book is when I say that word. But the word is nothing more than sounds that reverberate in the air. And the idea I have of a book is invisible to you. Hopefully you can't read my mind. By hearing that word, the sound waves reverberating through the air hits your eardrum. You thereby are able to know what I mean by saying it. Something visible or tangible, this, the sound waves in this case, so something sensible, makes present and communicates something invisible. And it affects what it signifies. That's sacramentality. A word is a sacrament in, a way, in this sense. It's a natural sacrament, though. Right? It's something instituted in creation itself. On a deeper level, I want to share an image I've come to love from Joseph Ratzinger. It's actually one of his earlier essays. It's in the 11th volume of his complete works on the liturgy. He uses the image of the meal in ancient religious traditions as a presentation of a natural sacrament. But I don't think we need to go that back, far back in time. In fact, I use meals as a very important and natural means to build up various communities in my own parish. And they help people encounter sacramentality in a way that isn't too foreign but is intensified by the Christian presence, uh, um, is intensified by the Christian presence there. So I wanna go through those six categories that I gave down. So it is a, a sacrament is a sign that is efficacious. So what is a meal a sign of? If we were just mere, merely biological creatures, a meal wouldn't be that important. It'd actually be, it served no function, right? Meals aren't functional. Look how much time you have to put into them. Right? It's a lot of work. There's a reason we actually don't like cooking just for one person, but we have no problem cooking for 10. But it's worth the work. Uh, if we were just biological creatures, we would just eat to receive the nutrients and so as to survive. We would take nutrient pills that would give us everything we need and we're done. We'd be the, we'd be the, the Jetsons. Um, but think of memorable meals you've had, and I can think of a few myself. What is the meal a sign of? Maybe it's the family's unity at Christmas dinner. The friendship that gathers together in this act, a, a wedding banquet, for example. The fair sharing of food with someone in need who is so hungry and lonely that is moved by your willingness not just to sit with them, but to eat with them on the sidewalk. We know instinctually, no matter how much modernity attempts to force us to forget, eating with others is important. It's vital to our humanity. And what, does the meal, what, is the meal, what is efficacious of the meal? Most importantly, communion. You can't have, in a way, you can't have a meal by yourself. A meal implies it being shared. In my own pastoral experience, I've experienced this this last year with my young adult group. Our first order of business is that it's a potluck meal we share together. And the shared meal brings about a shared communion and friendship that lasts. That is why I find it odd when parishes argue about the best programs to bring people together. It's actually not hard. Have people over for dinner. You've, you'll do more there than spending tens of thousands of dollars on the best parish renewal programs. Number two, it's instituted in creation. 
a meal is, is instituted in creation. We read in, in Genesis 129 when God commands man to till the earth and to, he can eat of all the, uh, the fruits and the vegetables of the earth. He addressed the, the address is to a you that in the plural sense of the word, to man as a social being. And that this comes, so already again, there's your meal implied right there. And it's instituted in creation before the fall. Before the fall. It's something God uh, puts at the very heart of what it means to be human. And this is something that's quite universal. Like, this is something every culture shares. There is no cultural relativism around a meal. It takes different expressions, but there is no cultural relativism around a meal. Um, and the creation account is meant to demonstrate that man is a spiritual bodily creature, that everything they do as human beings is personal and relational, and that that is essential to being human. And God institutes a meal which would be a seemingly just biological thing to just get nutrients as part of this creative, spiritual, personal human activity. It's instituted in creation. Number three, it dispenses life. Well, first, obviously, we cannot live without food. And to me, though, it's actually the most obvious one of all of them, because it also, this is where it really gets, it hits home with the questions of what the Eucharist is. There is something to the fact that Christ feeds us Eucharistically through our, through our consuming of his sacrifice. Uh, that this is the deepest means of communion with him. But just think more broadly and simply. When you last shared meals with friends, why'd you do it in the first place? What's the point? You do it because you like hanging out with them and being with them and sharing a meal with them brings life. That's the effect of a meal. Number four, visible rites and ceremonies are celebrated. We need to set a time aside a time, a place. We clean if we are having people over, hopefully. Uh, we, put out, we might put out the good dishes. We say grace before meals. Uh, we have certain protocols and, and norms for how we share food and what conversation is and isn't okay. It's, I mean, this is a very modernist, like secular sense of, 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 of the rule, but it's like, well, you don't talk about politics and religion at dinner. That's a social norm. That's a ritual. That is a ceremonial rule that you have for actually engaging in this. So it is a ritual. Absolutely, it's ritual. Like this, I think the biggest thing, uh, the reason we have a hard time with Catholicism because of the uh, liturgical element of it is people don't actually realize that actually we are incredibly liturgical day to day, just in a very secularized way and thus more banal way, I would argue. Number five, it signifies it makes present what is to be offered, affected. Food makes present the unity. One meal, many parts brought together in one meal. It brings, it draws us together and therefore the food literally gathers us. When my mom says she's gonna make sugar pie at Christmas, well you darn better believe it, I'm gonna be home for Christmas. <laughs> it gets me there, it unifies. And number six, it bears fruit in those refusing me. As you can tell, I've borne a lot of fruit <laughs> as a priest. Uh, <laughs> And we don't get just fed physically, but we get fed spiritually as well. We must be disposed to receiving it. But often just showing up shows us we are disposed to receiving the grace, the gift that the meal has to bear. So there's a lot more to say about the sacramentality of the meal, but time is running out. Although I'm actually I'm kind of right on time. This is amazing. I'm getting good at this. There's, there's benefits about being a priest. You know how long, how many words take to preach a homily. <laughs> and you know yourself well enough, okay, I'm gonna have a few tangents, so we're gonna be good, and anyways. So I wanna kinda of conclude with this. The whole point of my lecture is simple. It's to start to illustrate at least. We are sacramental creatures by nature, and modernism is trying to hide that from us, to make us not remember that this is our experience literally every moment of the day. That there are natural ways there are natural ways of imbuing life with sacramentality as it is constituted in creation. And in this sense, because creation itself is sacramental, there are means by which we can tap this for our benefit to revivify the sacramental structure so as to make Christianity uh, more understandable and palatable today. This is why, for example, I am not of the opinion that the church is like it was back in the apostolic era. It's not, I mean, for one, uh, the 12 apostles aren't around. Number two, we got 1.2 billion instead of like a few thousand. 
But also the world views different, vastly different. And in some ways they actually had it easier. The world understood all this. They didn't have to convince people about sacramentality. We have to do this now and emphasize first its naturalness so as to help people understand that the supernatural structure instituted by Christ, um, it, it builds upon and intensifies in a way that cannot be predicted, what is already got naturally built in by God in creation. Otherwise, God's entering a foreign element, and that doesn't work. And we have to remember that Jesus Christ himself is the sacrament par excellence. His humanity makes present, reveals, affects salvation by virtue of his unity to his divine nature. So how do we do this as both human beings and as a church? And I would propose that some of the problems I brought out in my introduction around context, proximity and integration have a lot to do with what we want to try to address. We need to accept our embodiedness as a gift, as spiritualized, as something that signifies what is effective in and through it. On the level of the church, we need to build upon, on the more kind of quote unquote programmatic side, the importance of the home, the domestic church, of if you will, like the domestic liturgy, if you will, of the family, of the land we are a part of, and of removing from money its magos, magical pseudo-sacramentality and use it for the good of building up our local parish life. Think locally. That's what we gotta be doing in this church. On the level of a more pastoral side, I would argue that the number one place is in liturgy. I call this talk mystery and modernism for a reason. Like as in the lexicon uh, tradition of the translation of the Bible, uh, St. Jerome translated the Greek word mysterion as sacramentum. Mystery and sacrament go hand in hand. Mystery, sacrament, history, and salvific event, these must be unified in the life of the church. A liturgy that refuses mystery in, the, in its presentation is a liturgy that refuses sacramentality and thus refuses both what is authentically human and also divinely instituted by Christ. In this regard, we must indeed learn from the past tradition in the church without becoming timeless. As if, you know, the tradition is just frozen once for all. And we must embrace history in such a way that it's that it is proper to history, that it has a past, a present, and a future all at once. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So we have to think that way too. Nor can our history ignore the past and just push it on towards a future which seemingly has no end to the point where we're going towards a, a horizon that evolves to become something completely disconnected from its past and something totally different. Neither of those are a healthy approach to liturgy. A good sacramental vision is a good human vision and a good liturgical vision symbolically embodies this on every level. The most pastoral response we can offer is, lit is, is liturgy. And, and liturgy that is beautiful and in a way, yes, a little weird. But not weird to a point of it being like dehistoricized or decontextualized, but says we have a past that is present here because we have a presence here. We have Christ, whereby the past comes to affect in us a change for our future, for our eternity. Only in this way can we begin to slowly rediscover the sacramental structure at the heart of human existence as Christians. 802, not too bad. Thank you very much. <laughs>